Hello, everyone. Welcome. So great to see you. Happy Thursday. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 898th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have today the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation with Harry Philbrick, DJ Hellerman, Deborah Bricker Balkin, and a closing poetry reading by Thomas Devaney. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Harry Philbrick has over 25 years of experience in museum management, exhibition development, and educational programming, and founded Philadelphia Contemporary in 2016. Philbrick is keenly aware of the challenges in making, making contemporary art accessible to a wide variety of audiences. Philbrick became the interim executive director of the Fabric Workshop and Museum in 2023, leading this innovative artist-focused institution through strategic repositioning. DJ Hellerman is chief curator and director of curatorial affairs at the Fabric Workshop and Museum, where he leads the research and implementation of artist-centered projects, exhibitions, and programming. He's committed to building relationships based on trust, effective communication, and vulnerability to allow for the openness and intimacy that's essential to creating mean meaningful work. And our host today is Deborah Bricker Balkan, an award-winning independent curator, scholar, and writer who has assembled numerous exhibitions on subjects related to American modernism and contemporary art for many major museums internationally. Her recent publications include Arthur Dove, a catalog resume of paintings and things from Yale University Press, among others. And it is such a huge honor and a joy to have you here to discuss Fabric Workshop. And with that, I will pass it over to Deborah to start. Great, thank you. It's lovely to be here um, um, at the rail with um, to moderate this conversation with, with Harry and DJ on the current state um, of the Fabric um, Workshop and Museum, a remarkably innovative institution um, that was founded um, by Marion Bolton Stroud, um, or Kippy, as she was fondly known by everyone who entered into um, her orbit. Um, so very briefly, because we're going to touch on these issues in the conversation, I just want to give you a little bit of a sketch um, of the Fabric Workshop Museum. It was founded or conceived by Kippy um, in 1977 as an artist residency program with an adjunct um, student apprenti apprenticeship um, um, component and um, wherein various artists were invited to Philadelphia to Kibbe's facilities um, to print um, fabric or yardage or produce yardage. Um, <clears throat> Kibbe had a number, uh, two models in mind um, when she conceived of this project. One was historic and that was the arts and crafts movement that was inaugurated by William Morris in the late 19th century, um, which developed a, a notion of total design, something that I think also runs through uh, many of Kippy's projects. But there was also a contemporary parallel um, that she drew on, and that was the emergence of the pattern and decoration uh, movement in the, in the 1970s, um, spearheaded again by artists such as Robert Kishner and Kim McConnell who began to use fabric as a medium um, in their objects um, and um, performances. And Kibbe, of course, knew many of these uh, figures associated with the P&D movement um, from, from its inception. But the fabric workshop um, very quickly ceased to be fabric focused, um, even though it's a mainstay or um, fixture um, of its um, of its programming, um, it, 
and it began to introduce new materials, that is diverse materials, as artists felt the need um, to um, expand on their ideas um, and, and forms. And along with that, the uh, workshop soon became um, a collection and subsequently became a museum and archive. And we're going to be talking about those various um, components of the FWM um, um, today. But I also felt that before we embark on our discussion that it was very important to insert Kippy's voice um, into this, into this um, conversation. And I wanna read four linked quotes from an interview that was conducted with her in 2002 on the on the at the eve um, at the time of the 25th anniversary um, um, of her project. She remarks on the purpose of the museum by FWM um, by stating, quote, to explore, to take liberties, to be a studio and laboratory of new design, unhampered by rules and precedents. She goes on to elaborate that at the inception, quote, the question of high versus low and art versus craft became irrelevant once we began to work with artists since their work could be all of these at once. And she qualifies, um, artists want more philosophical content-driven statements. They are more interested in large scale projects now they want a whole room for their installations. And lastly, she, um, at the end of this interview, both pragmatically and rather poignantly states, 50 years from now, when I have been dead for a while, I will see FWM still responding to the needs of artists of the times. Philadelphia audiences have been superbly responsive and I hope that we will continue to introduce them to contemporary art trends from around the world. We are an artist-driven organization and we always will be. We also <clears throat> provide a record of the history of our time. Most important, I see it ongoing as a creative process. So um, before we just get into this, um, <laughs> this discussion, um, the rail asked me to touch very briefly, you know, on my relationship um, with Kippy. How did I know her? Um, I was a part of a parallel program that Kippy had developed sometime in the early 90s, I believed. Um, it was a summer residency program based on Mount Desert Island in northern Maine. And um, I was invited in the late 1990s to um, be a guest in the program and was lucky enough to benefit from her largesse and generosity over almost 18 years. The, um, the program was composed of um, artists, of cur curators, um, writers, musicians, um, choreographers, um, as well as museum directors. And we would assemble on Mount Desert for you know, approximately upwards of a, of a two week period where we were um, given lodging, we were flown up, we were given a rental car. She had an extraordinary chef that um, prepared dinners for us three nights a week. And the only obligation was that we deliver a lecture on some aspect of a project upon which we were working or an idea that we were, that we were ad advancing through um, a, recent, um, a, a recent project. Um, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary, exhilarating um, program, as is the fabric workshop um, and museum. And there was considerable overlap between these two entities um, in that Kippy drew from um, the, the FWM to populate um, this residency program. And she would also invite other figures who had never participated in her Philadelphia project um, to Maine. And sometimes those, those figures were invited to Philadelphia subsequently for a residency and or um, exhibition. But, you know, with Kippy's death in 2015, the programs very, very sadly came to an end. Um, but it was also a program that unlike the Fabric Workshop Museum that probably could never have ever been institutionalized. It was very Kippy centric. It was extraordinarily, um, you know, exhilarating. 
um, experience. I've, I made numerous lasting friendships um, through that program, but Kippy knew that her real legacy was in Philadelphia at the Fabric Workshop Museum. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to, um, to Harry and DJ to acquaint us with some of the early projects that were um, executed in Philadelphia and then look at the current direction and initiatives and programming. Great, thank you so much, Deborah. Um, Eleanor, maybe we should pull some slides up. So as, as Deborah mentioned, the workshop was founded in 1977 and uh, let's scroll ahead. And uh, here is our current home on Arch Street with a facade designed by Richard Venturi. Um, and I think the next slide shows, yeah, there you go. Um, so on the left, you can see the full building. It's an eight story building. It was originally designed uh, and built as a flag factory. So it's been a fabric uh, producing uh, structure for a long time, but the workshop has not always been here. Uh, if we go on to the next slides, we're gonna, uh, well, there's Kippy, Good goodness. Um, for those of you who knew Kippy, um, those uh, blue tape bracelets were, uh, ubiquitous, and uh, she managed to make them into high fashion. I just, I loved those. Um, but yeah, let's go on to the next slide. So here, very early days with Anda Harnacourt on the left and, and Kippy on the right. Um, the workshop has always been located in Philadelphia and always within uh, spitting distance of the Reading Terminal Market. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Philly and don't know the market, it's a, a beautiful uh, food emporium, and it's a, it's a really beating heart of the city of Philadelphia. So we've been located on Cherry Street, on Arch Street. Here you can see the long print tables that were at the core of the initial programming. Uh, although, as Deborah mentioned, uh, the, the program moved beyond screen printing or widened out. We've never left screen printing. Uh, widened out beyond screen printing quite early on. Um, early uh, photo of Kippy with some artist editions and multiples, and you can see the kind of all over design. Um, you can, yeah, there we go. And the, the screen printing operation started with artists and, and simultaneously with the apprentice program working with Philadelphia uh, teenagers and then soon thereafter with college students. And that has been uh, perhaps the, the unsung but incredibly valuable work of the workshop over the years. The number of individuals and major artists who have gone through the program here at the workshop as apprentices is, is truly astounding. And it's something that we're really focusing on now about trying to build awareness of the education programming here at the museum. Um, and maybe DJ, let's get you jumping in here to talk a little bit about the summer kimono workshop and how that kind of tied our past to our present. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Harry. And also just thanks to the Brooklyn Rail team, Eleanor, um, Chloe, thank you so much. 898, it's like, it's okay that we're not 900, but um, but congratulations. It's a it's a feed and um, new social. It's, this program has been really important. Um, so thanks. Um, yeah. So what's happening here? Um, one of the things that I have um, internalized the most and really learned from the most you know, from Kippy Legacy is that you know it's we the workshop and Camp Kippy were never institutions that would you know as i call it flip tables um when you kind of intimacy and community were the name of the game and it's not um you know when sometimes when someone would come in they could do an, a residency for an undetermined amount of time or um sometimes people have three residencies like richard tuttle um and if you go i think to the next slide you can see here yeah so um, in 2015, Richard um, did his third residency. Um, it's also a big exhibition here. Um, but, and he really wanted to create a summer kimono. Um, 
and that was in our so that was a project that we worked on and this past year um, we had a kimono master come back and teach a make your own summer kimono workshop over the course of two weekends you know so so fabric is still really you know um something central and a through line to our programming and really we have an incredible education team that makes amazing programs happen um so just the, the kind of education that goes along with our exhibition programs and our residency programs are um super exciting and half the time i'm upset that i'm just a little a little too busy to participate sometimes um but it's probably better i don't have a summer come so this right richard um, project i just want to jump in dj the the um there's a couple of things about this project that are so resonant of what the workshop is in that Richard wanted to use a traditional Japanese printing technique. It, it looks to the untrained eye like it might just be silk screened, but it's actually an incredibly complex process that was done in Japan uh, to, to print the fabric uh, to his, his liking. And the kimono happened simultaneously with an installation of a, a exhibition um of his works uh traveling exhibition that came here to the workshop uh and richard oversaw the installation of it and the lighting of it and to this day it was one of the my favorite exhibitions i've ever seen anywhere it was such an idiosyncratic hang and such an idiosyncratic uh lighting job uh on the exhibition no other museum i think in the world would have would have allowed the artist to get away with that, if you will. Uh, it was a complete, it broke every rule in terms of the lighting being off. Uh, but the experience was magical. You really felt like you were discovering works that were were kind of secret, that, that only you discovered. It was a, a really magical experience that, that could be allowed to happen with that artist. Can I just back up and ask if you could, um, if you could um, enumerate how many um, artists are invited to the FWM at this point in time per year, and how many of those projects result in exhibitions? Jay? Yeah, so it, it, it depends on kind of scale and scope, but at any any time we could have six to 12 artists in residence. Um, and the, the residency program, I can give a little bit of a background for people who don't, who don't know how it works, but we're a making institution. Um, so we have six or seven, full-time artists on staff, um, that when an artist gets a residency at the workshop, um, that becomes a team to help you explore and experiment. Um, so we sometimes we do kind of checklist exhibitions where you kind of pick work and bring it in, but that's very rare and that doesn't happen very often. So we are really, really involved in the making with an artist. Um, when you know when somebody has an idea, they want to try something. You know, um, we're we're the people that help kind of explore and push the the way that ideas find their material form. Um, so we have an amazing studio team um, that work with, again, six to 12 artists, depending on where it goes. And the residency is structured, I guess, loosely in a couple different ways. The first part of the residency is um, like a dream phase. Um, it's exploration, it's, it's looking, it's talking, it's dreaming. Um, then there's a third phase, which is a, or a second phase, which is like a production or a prototyping phase. So dreaming, then prototyping. So it's kind of how do we start to actually make this dream happen? And then a production phase. Um, and then for, for those who want to have an exhibition, if the project makes sense, we have the exhibition phase. Um, so that and, and that's the, you know, the the kind of the fourth, I guess, and final uh, part of the, the the process here. So a lot of what we do in an exhibition goes up is kind of the beginning, the beginning of our end you know, in a, in, a, in a lot of ways. And residencies can last anywhere from, you know, recent history, you know, 18 months to two and a half years um, earlier, you know, residencies could sometimes go on for seven, eight, maybe even nine years <laughs> and bleed into bleed into something else. So the time was a little bit indeterminate. Um, and we do our museum, so we're making institution. And then we also, um, you know, we have we have museum objects that we use in our collection for exhibitions, um, like the exhibition right now on our eighth floor called Sonic Presence. It's a mix of work um, that's here on loan and work from our own collection. Mm -hmm. So do all of the residency um, projects result in an exhibition? They don't. Recently, a lot have. Um, and that's not something that we 
we necessarily um, impose. It's whether or not the project calls for it, whether or not the artist really wants it. You know, um, you know, like that quote you read, you know, from Kippy, and she's a a keen listener, and that's something that you know we do here really well is listen. And if the project's going to take us into an exhibition, then it's going to take us into an exhibition. And we have amazing spaces for that. So, you know, Kibbe was listening and we have a building that is really amazing, you know, ex you know, exhibition space. Yeah. So not always, but 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 a lot of the times recently it has. So artists are brought to Philadelphia if they don't ex live in Philadelphia. And um, are, you, are, are they given accommodations? Or how does that work? Again, um, you know, there's never a one size fits all. So um, it depends on the project. Um, so some artists, you know, are based in Philadelphia. So that's a different thing. Some artists and most artists are not. Um, so we are, I guess I would say, a non-residency based residency program and where we have sustained engagement over a period of time. Um, like with Henry Taylor's exhibition that's up right now, Henry would come in for periods of time. We would fly um, to LA for periods of time um, to be able to work with him. Um, and depending on what, you know, what the project needed, what kind of space we need to, to actually make the work, um, you know, and, and it's a, it's a really great way to give an idea the space that it needs to explore, um, so, you know, it's not a, you have six weeks and we have to produce something to the public. It's, you know, we can, we can really binge and work really intensely. And then we can all come up for air and think about it and get some perspective and kind of go back in again. Um, and this is, this, yeah, thank you. This is uh, Henry Taylor's exhibition that's up right now. There's a really amazing program in Philly called Rare, uh, the Recycled Artists in Residence Program. Um, and Henry was up, you know, sourcing found material for his exhibition here. And, you know, Henry's show is one of these kind of career defining shows, in my opinion, where artists come to the workshop and what you expect from Henry Taylor is not what you're going to get from Henry Taylor in our exhibition here. Um, you know, Henry has an exhibition opening um, at the Whitney, and I hope that you all can go see that and come here. Um, Henry's show closes at the end of October um, to see what happens when the workshop, here you go, this is the installation, you know, for the we unstretched canvas, we made 30 foot paintings with Henry and that wasn't enough. So then we made 60 foot horizon, paint and horizon paintings with Henry. Um, it was a really big material investigation. The show was called Nothing Changed, Nothing Strange, um, but it was it started with his investigation of a tartan. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we used that, the idea of a tartan as a philosophical and conceptual like point of departure. Right. So just to clarify, there isn't an application process. This is by invitation only. That's right. It's an invitation only. Um, Kippy has had a, a long time, you know, a really big and diverse group of advisors. And we still have that artist advisory committee, which is a really important committee, um, you know, eyes and ears in the world. Um, and mm. I would just say it's also, um, it also is a program that can be very challenging for artists. Um, it's not the truthfully, it's just not right for everyone because it's really invasive. Um, you know, we have seven artists on staff that, you know, are, 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 are willing to collaborate and get into the idea. And the, the idea is not that we produce whatever an artist wants. It's that we collaborate with them. So there is a push and pull in a give and take and someone who needs to be open enough, um, to be able to to listen and and have this environment of trust and intimacy where we can actually really make something work. And Henry stepped into that in a way that was so energetic and so incredible um, that the show, these two pieces are kind of like, I think really iconic um, images that that come from from Henry stepping into that project with, with everything he, he had. It was amazing to work so closely with him. I, I wanna to touch on that because in working with artists, we, we really start with the premise of what do you want to do that you haven't done before, or maybe even not there, but you've done all of this before. Let's go on a path that you haven't gone down before. And so there is a sense of vulnerability in exploring where that might take you. Um, and 
to that end, I think DJ is absolutely right. The process is not for every artist. It, it reminds me in some ways of Mass Mocha, where you have those huge galleries. And if it's the right fit, oh, my God, it's one of the best things ever. But it's not necessarily for every artist to, to do that. Right. And so there have been wildly successful projects and some projects that I would imagine did not work out. Always. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's how that's, it goes. <laughs> that's how it goes. Absolutely. And and I think if you don't fail, then you're not you're not succeeding as an institution because you've got to be taking those risks. Right. I think, yeah, and I think timing is really important in that conversation because, you know, I mean, if we if we're going to cap the idea of success or failure based on an 18 to 25 month or, you know, two year, two and a half, three year process. Okay. But, you know, most of the time we're not in it for two years and we're not in it for 18 months. So sometimes something that happens here at the workshop is a really generative moment. And maybe it doesn't find it, the landing point at the moment that it happened here, but that it can, it can kind of, you know, slowly develop in an artist's career and then it kind of pops up later in a way that starts to make a little bit more sense so it's really a long game i think when you kind of think of think about that um right right so 2023 um could be passed um eight years ago and you know harry when we were talking the other day i asked you if you thought that the museum was still in a state of transition and you and you said yes and i'm wondering if you can just elaborate on that for for our audiences here sure um you know when when kippy died it was so unexpected um and the institution had been run in such an idiosyncratic way uh and you know i, I touched on in the uh richard tuttle project how that idiosyncrasy led to the magic of that exhibition but the idiosyncrasy also meant that when that one central figure was no longer there, the institution needed to figure out how to move forward. Um, and a lot of uh, structure needed to be put in place without killing the, the magic that was the institution. And uh, Susan Talbot became the director uh, in, that, in the early years after Kippy passed and really did a fabulous job in terms of um, putting into place some structures uh, and working through the process of transitioning from a budgeting process that was really dependent on Kippy almost entirely um, into a process where it's a much more um, sustained and rational um, process. That, took some time and took some doing. There's a lot of systems to put into place. And then uh, Christina Vassalo joined um, and really brought a new youthful energy into the directorship. Um, of course, she arrived almost immediately before COVID hit. So that was a real challenge for her to, to, to navigate. But during Christina's tenure here, um, the workshop began to really look to try to figure out how can we move beyond the financial structure that is in place here. And, you know, there's, when Kippy died, the bulk of her estate went to a foundation and that foundation uh, very generously supports the workshop along with other organizations that were, were dear to Kippy and important to her, primarily the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, but also, among others, the College of the Atlantic up in Mount Desert Island. But both the foundation and the workshop um, are cognizant of the fact that the workshop can't be too dependent forever on the foundation. So we've really embarked on a process of exploring what um, what is the structure that we can create uh, that will really allow the workshop to be here 50 years uh, well, I guess 43 years from now, when, uh, 50th anniversary of when Kippy's gone. Um, and we're, we're well into that process. And I'm very excited about um, some of the directions we're exploring there. 
but there's universal agreement on the, the board and the staff, the board of the workshop, the board of, of the foundation, that the core essence of the fabric workshop needs to stay the same. Um, and what that is, is nurturing creativity and supporting artists as they um, explore projects. So we're in that sense, the difference between the workshop and a, a traditional contemporary art museum is that a traditional contemporary art museum really focuses on the end product, the exhibition. And we focus much more on the, the process of getting to that exhibition. And that's reflected in what the exhibition turns out to be. And it also is reflected in our collection. Um, and, and DJ is, is fond of saying that as if our name weren't long enough, the fabric workshop and museum, you've got three big nouns in there. We should have a fourth, which is archive um, because our archives are extraordinary. They're, they're not, you know, when you think of the word archives, you tend to think of lots of file cabinets full of paper, but our archives are uh, on the one hand in the studio, uh, we have archives of incredibly detailed records of every artist's print that's been made here and all the different, uh, the formulas for the ink that was used, the exact color that was used, uh, the experimentation that went into it before those colors were identified, uh, the various different screens that uh, are involved in creating the printed object. And then in terms of the individual artists and in residents, uh, we have artist boxes uh, reflecting the, the development process of each project uh, and of each artist's endeavor. And these are just a, a little tiny taste of, of what's in those boxes. Um, it's often material exp explorations and experimentation. Uh, it's creative um, uh, offshoots that never came to fruition. And they really are a phenomenal time capsule of the development of the project, of where that artist was at that particular moment, and also of evolving technology. Uh, because of course, you know, since 1977 to now, what an artist, what tools are available to an artist uh, have changed so radically. So our archives, I think, are, are a, a phenomenally important part of what the workshop is. And those are stored in-house or off-site? Those are stored in-house. Um, and art storage was a big issue for us. Um, when Kippy died, there, was, there were objects scattered around in various different locations. And over the last few years, there's been a very sustained effort to bring everything under the roof of the workshop. And we're, we're not quite there, but we're virtually there. Um, and, and all of the archives are indeed here. Mm -hmm. right. Eleanor, if you go back one more image, you can start to see the exterior of the boxes. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> yeah, so, so we have boxes going all the way back from over almost every single artist in residence, sometimes multiple boxes, sometimes they're a lot bigger than this. <laughs> Um, but, you know, putting together those boxes is a really amazing conversation to have with the studio team, with the artist. Um, and you see here, like, our, you know, Katie and our education team showing Jonathan Linden Chase um, boxers, which we made as a limited edition artwork. Um, so that's one thing also, I guess we could touch on just quickly is that one of the ways um, for a long time, the workshop has made limited edition multiples with with artists and um, we have formalized that program a little bit, just kind of called it ShopWorks. And um, Olivia Dwyer, who's on our studio team, is really leading that charge. Um, and we have amazing objects. So we're now working with artists and residents to also um, make make limited edition multiples. So this is, um, these are Jonathan Linden Chase's boxers, like I said. And then if you go, I think backwards, Eleanor, a little bit further. Um, no, I'm wrong. I think it's forward. We did, yeah, it's after Rose, keep going. So with, with Rose Simpson, um, who many know her, um, her kind of figurative sculpture work, she did a project here not that long ago called Dream House. And it was a really beautiful architectural installation, um, Adobe, Adobe inspired architecture. If you kind of move forward a little bit, you can see some of the, it, this is the setup that comes, yeah, here we go. 
um, Rose was teaching us how to plaster the walls and we had like eight people working on a quarter of the wall and Rose did three quarters of the wall in about you know a fraction of the time as we were learning how how to work in this technique with her um, if you go to the next image this is the interior one of the spaces these were all kind of modeled after the bandelier monument and you can kind of stick your head in but you actually couldn't enter these spaces these were very important um amazing like moments of intimacy for rose the first time she worked in videos first time she did installation like this the first time she did wall painting which you'll see in another image um and then there was a space that you could enter which was called the processing space um which is the next image i think and then, yeah, so this is a space where you, people could, you know, visitors could take their take their shoes off and sit in this space and congregate. And we knew we wanted to help um, give, give something to do. And Rose had this idea to create um, um, like a, a, a deck of cards um, that people could, could play with. And if you go forward two images, these are, um, yeah, these are the guidance cards that Rose designed and we produced. We produced one kind of an unlimited edition set that's for sale in our museum shop, and then one limited edition set that's for sale in our museum shop. And these were really beautiful cards for visitors of the museum can sit in the space and you would hold the deck, ask the deck a question, and then, you know, shuffle the deck and pull three cards, lay them over in the upper right hand corner, you can see you they're all shapes so what you would do is have to sit with your friends and try and figure out what the cards were telling you about what you asked the deck um which is a really beautiful process um, for people to go through so um we have an amazing shop um with uh, like amazing objects it's a it's a if you if you want to get a really incredible gift for somebody that's a place to go um yeah this is a picture of the shop designed by Virgil marty we have amazing yardage for people um, to use, yeah, Mary Heilman in the back, one of my one of my absolute favorite yardages that we have. Um, and then Jason Musson did a project here not that long ago, um, just a year ago. It's traveling. It will open in Cincinnati, at the CAC, pretty soon. Um, but we produced um, a limited edition uh, furry doll. Um, for Jason's exhibition. There's a slide of it back. It's right before Rose's images. Um, Jason, you know, many, many people know Jason for Tennessee Young Window, but you just passed it right there. Um, and we filmed three, we, we filmed three episodes of a of a project called His History of Art that was based on Jason's Tennessee Youngman. So we turned the whole gallery space into a filming studio, which was really complicated during COVID you know, as we were testing and masking. And um, so this was, we built the whole set, filmed the three issue, or filmed the three different episodes. Um, and as a part of that, we created one, a catalog, but then two, a limited edition furry of Ollie, which is Jay, the kind of the, the, the decade on character of Tennessee Youngman up, update, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, there he goes. This is this cute little plushie, which is also um, available in our gift shop. So it's really, as you can tell, it's a, there's a, there's a rambunctious energy. Um, and the idea is, yeah, obviously keep that, keep that rambunctious energy and all the projects that we're doing. Hey, can you tell us about some of your um, future projects? Sure. Um, if you scroll ahead, um, we have an opening on October 5th, um, Jessica Campbell, you can see it's an exhibition called Heterodoxy. Um, so Jessica, so we have a couple really big spaces and then we have a couple more reasonably sized spaces, which is good for some work. And this one, um, we are carpeting the entire gallery. We have hand tufted carpeted walls of the gallery. So I think the next slide might have some process images. Um, and Jessica's project is based on the heterodoxy movement. Here we go, that's a good one. That's, that's our fifth floor studio space where you can see um, we're making 16 or 18 of these um, hand tufted panels that will go on the wall will be artifacts embedded in the wall and Jessica's project is in, is really thinking about this group called the heterodoxy which was a kind of radical feminist group from um the early 1900s that met at a place called Polly's Cafe um 
in the Greenwich Village and um, didn't keep notes, didn't, it was kind of a secretive group of all kind of well-to-do women to talk about progressive politics in a safe space. Um, so this is Jessica's um, kind of reinterpretation and kind of riffing off of, off of that movement and their designs. Um, we have a couple more images here. So that's coming up. And then we're doing an exhibition called Process Lab in the future in November, um, which is working with three different artists, um, Michelle Lopez, Paper Buck, um, and Sadia Rahman. And the idea is that the, the entire exhibition will be focused on artworks that haven't found their final form yet. Um, so we are, the, the, nothing in the show will be finished and the space will continue to evolve throughout the run of the exhibition. Um, so our, the, the workshop role in that project is to push it forward. Um, it's not to start it, it's not to finish it, but it is to just push it forward and help the artists use the platform um, as they continually seek um, a, a potential final form for something that hasn't found that form yet. So how That's far in, out? in the recent. Yeah, how far out are your exhibitions projected at this point in time? I know, you know, Kippy secretly would um, assemble exhibitions within, you know, a few months, um, something I can't imagine, but something that she pulled off with complete aplomb. Um, but I imagine you're working with a longer lead time at this point in time. Well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, um, but but an ethos is an ethos and um, sometimes it's very quick. Um, so, you know, there are some realities of, of funding that dictate projects, you know, we, we're planning out three, four, even five years, the 50th anniversary is in 2027. That's really exciting for us um, mm -hmm. and something we're already talking about, um, you know, and we're working with artists in residence now who have shows in February and, you know, um, into late 20. 24, early 2025, um, and then we'll start to shift to our 50th anniversary programming. But we do keep, you know, we do keep some spaces not programmed, and it's a way for us to kind of keep keep an energy high and be a little more nimble when we need to be nimble. That's really, that's an important um, value, I think. Um, maybe I would say it's a value, but, or just the personality of this institution. Right. We have an upcoming project with Eko Otake that, that fits into that bill. Um, the Asian Arts Initiative is doing a project with Eko, and they reached out to us about a really kind of modest collaboration, and it instead turned into us doing a, an installation here and a performance here as well. And that's all come together, what, in three months, DJ? Yeah, and I would, yes, yes. And we're all, we're clearing a space, we're, redo, we're rethinking the entrance to the museum, um, you know, in a very short amount of time, also that we can give that space, the project, give that project the space and the kind of energy that it needs. So there's, you know, there's a lot of shifting and a lot of movement here um, to make room for and support ideas. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, a three to five year lead time. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the extreme, um, Will Stokes has been here for how many years working away? Yeah, since the beginning, I think 77. Yeah, yeah. that photo was taken. So uh, there's yeah, the remarkable so consistency and also total innovation happening at the same time. Yeah, Willie's here every day um, working in the studio. Fabulous. Okay. Anything else you want to add about the your new initiatives, direction, future? I think I would uh, circle back to, um, well, a couple of things. One is we are doing um, our annual fundraiser on the 27th of September. And I saw someone in the chat had had uh, brought a quote from uh, the, the tagline for that. So I encourage all of you to come on down and, and celebrate the workshop and support what we do. Um, DJ mentioned the 50th anniversary coming up in in. Uh, 2027 and we're just beginning to conceive of what that will be um we don't want to just look back over the 50 years although we will do that but we don't want that to be the only um aspect of of that programming and uh we also are engaged in a number of conversations with institutions around philadelphia about some 
potential really substantial long-term strategic partnerships that were uh, just at the beginning phases of exploring. So there's a lot of, of movement behind the scenes, um, all of which is is really in support of that ongoing mission of, of working with artists and, and encouraging uh, and, and nurturing their creative process. Eugene? I don't know. I'm, oh, there's a lot, I'm sure, that I'm not thinking of at this moment. I just, you know, one of the things that looking at the slides, it's just making it so contagious here, you know? I think that's the thing I'm thinking about is the studio and the, you, you, the tactile is contagious here. And that's a really important part of looking forward is making sure that, um, you know, the we want, we want people to want to touch things here. We don't necessarily want them to touch, um, you know, some things that are fragile, but you know, the we leaving here inspired to to try and make something, um, I think is really something that's just on my mind a lot. Um, you know. Yeah. I think an, another uh, example uh, for an upcoming project, uh, we're working with uh, the artist John Jarbeau, and John uh, is one of the founders of the Bearded Ladies here in, in Philadelphia. And in fact, she has a performance opening tonight at the Fringe Festival here in, in Philly. And crossing the boundary of, uh, or from the performing art side into a physical uh, manifestation of a project is a process that's being worked through with that project. And uh, I really am, am pleased and proud of that kind of process here. and. The openness to really working with um, artists from all different approaches, uh, and I, I think that's something that um, provides its own set of challenges. Um, you know, making video sets and making videos is one thing, but accommodating live performance within the context of the built environment is another one. So the explorations continue. Right. Should we open it up for questions? Yeah, by all means. Sure, thank you so, so much, Harry and DJ and Deborah for this really inspiring and generous conversation. Um, there's so much amazing and special work going on at Fabric Workshop and Museum. It's been so great to hear about it. Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or send a message in the chat. But our first question today will be from SL, and I will give you the opportunity to unmute. Oh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for um, such a great conversation. Um, I was curious, I'm sure I'm not the only artist on, but um, the Artist Advisory Committee has a giant job in that artists that are selected generally won't be making what they're typically known for. They're going to be given the opportunity to really sort of stretch or transform in that moment. And so I'm curious what the committee looks to do in addition, obviously, to just sort of the level of art making that is already happening for the artists. What 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 other sort of things are, is the committee looking to um, in their selection process? Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question. And, you know, I don't, it's not a, I don't have a formulaic answer, I think for you um, that could like make it clear. I'd say it, it depends. Um, first and foremost, I think people are sharing what um, they've been looking at, what they're seeing, because, you know, as one institution in Philly, we only have so many kind of eyes and ears. So they're in the world looking. Um, I think there's always a, a nod to connecting with our history. Um, in some way, um, there's some looking at artists who have a disposition who could Kind of really step into and embrace um, the kind of the kind of support, but um, for a different kind of person, it could be a nuisance, you know, of the kind of help that we can provide. Um, and um, looking for somebody, I think looking a lot at artists where this is a this is seem, it seems like an apt moment um, in their career where the support of the workshop could really help help somebody develop an idea that they couldn't do otherwise. Um, so I think those are just off the top of my head um, the, that 
those are a lot of the questions that come up. They help point out, you know, blind spots if we have any. Um, they have a really holistic view of the organization. Um, the Artist Advisory Committee, our board, the KP Foundation, they're all, they all know the workshop and, and this institution really well. Um, and that's very, very helpful um, as stewards of a program um, going through a kind of an institutional change. Thank you for that question. Um, and we have kind of a follow-up question um, from Liz, and I will ask on Liz's behalf. Liz is wondering, is Fabric Workshop and Museum more interested in providing opportunities for artists who don't work in fabric, or do you look also at artists who already work with or in fabric? I, I'll go get here, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, again, it, it depends. I don't think there's a more interest, you know, um, you could see certain projects, um, you know, I think probably Henry Taylor is not someone people would associate with, with fabric. Um, and he came with a really strong idea of, and I think part of it, our name leads sometimes. Um, and, you know, talking with Henry was really interested in the idea of a tartan and really thinking about that um, politically, materially, you know, formally. Um, so, so no, um, I, I think, I think it's both. And I don't, I don't think there's a one way or the other. It, it, it's a both. And, and, and we try to have a, a, a mix of that in our programming so that it's not, you know, it's like, it's art and craft, it's P and D, you, you know, it, it's conceptual, it's material. It's like all, it's, we need to be as, as complicated of a thing um, within that world as, as we can be. Um, and I think that's, I think that's the, that's probably the, what, what they're interested in. I think if you, if you go back to our name and those three nouns, the, the noun that's most important is workshop. Um, is that sense of, of making things and um, fabric is certainly a, a big part of it, but it is not the core in in every project by any by any stretch of the imagination. Even the Jessica Campbell project, we were showing you the tufted rugs um, that are wall hangings, but the other central element of that installation, which we don't have photographs of it because it being fabricated a little bit later as a series of tables that have objects in them that are set into the surface of the table. And there's a reflective oval reflective mirror a bunch above each object that that slowly illuminates and, and gets darker so that you have this sort of lily pad effect of, of objects coming and going. And it's kind of insanely complicated tech, uh, technically to make that thing work um, and has nothing to do with fabric. Um, so we have an incredibly talented staff of, of artists who are fabricators and, and co-creators on the projects and also um, happily located here in Philadelphia because Philadelphia is such a collegial city and there are so many organizations and, and crafts folk that, that can help out on projects. So um, we really... Well, we are a nexus for the the fabrication and creation of work. We really are dependent on the the whole kind of makers ecosystem here in Philadelphia. Amazing. Yeah, we have a project coming up with um, Risa Puno. It's going to be called Group Hug, and um, that that exhibition is going to be really a fun kind of game based exhibition where you know it's it's putting together ideas of whack a mole with a, a stand as a lift assist chair and so we're, we have programmers and you know we have upholsters and we have sculptures and we have carpenters and um, we're trying to program how to connect different things so that people can use the space like an interactive game environment um so uh yeah <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um of there's a lot of interesting projects coming up Incredible. Um, we have another question um, from Nicole, and I will ask on Nicole's behalf. I think it was partially addressed in the chat, but we'd love to hear from the speakers on this. Um, Nicole wrote, how does Fabric Workshop sustain the archives? Is there an archival team? Can the public have access to the archives? EJ, do you want to have that one? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have amazing archives and we have a very modest you know infrastructure to support that um so the archives are not available to the public in terms of nine to five um but if anyone you know would like to see those archives they're here and they can send an email to our we, we get it through our info or for you know whomever we have researchers coming in all the time looking at artist boxes you know potentially looking at asap um you know um videos and tapes um and then you know yeah like justin who's our marketing communications um director putting in our chat to assist me um on saturdays we do amazing um screen printing tours that you can register for and on sundays um we do behind the scenes collection tours um now that's not necessarily a choose your own adventure so if you had to you know if you have a very specific kind of question um, that you know, we can we we field all those as quickly and as efficiently as we can to welcome people into the space. Um, but if you're just curious, um, you know, mo almost every weekend we have those tours that are open. Um, you can just register and come in and take them midday, Saturday, midday, Sunday. Very cool. Um, our next question is going to be from GE, and GE, I will give you the chance to unmute. Oh, actually, GE is not in the call anymore, but I will uh, read some of GE's questions. Um, one question that GE had is, what is the most unusual material that's ever graced an exhibition at Fabric Workshop? And also, has Fabric Workshop ever hosted an exhibit that uses fabric as a metaphor? Oh, GE is here. And I'll, I'll give you a chance to unmute just in case you want to add anything, GE. Sorry about that. If you want to add anything, feel free to jump in. No, I love it. Thank you so much. I don't know what happened on the glitch end. I'm sorry. It's probably my end. I'm sorry. Um, but thank you for 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 inviting me to do this. Um, yeah, certainly, I think you, you, you certainly, um, in the chat, we're, we're talking about all the strange or different or wonderful materials. And, and then also, um, the idea of, you know, addressing the idea of, uh, of using, uh, fabric as a metaphor uh, for exhibits. But I guess I, I had one more question that I, I was thinking of during, during the thing is, have any of the exhibitors or any of the exhibits incorporated some form of AI within, within their making? On on uh, April Fool's Day, we put out an Instagram post saying that our entire um, process was going to be devoted to AI moving forward. <laughs> and I can't, this is, <laughs> um, Justin, who's on here somewhere, was responsible for that post. And I can't tell you how many people reacted, uh, on the one hand, absolutely appalled and disgusted that we would be going down this route. And on the other hand, there were those that were like, yeah, right on. You guys are always at the forefront. Go for it. Uh, but to date, no, we have not done anything with AI. Um, in in terms of most unusual materials, I, I, I'm sitting at my desk looking at a photograph of the Sai Guo Chang uh, project that we did with fireworks and explosives within the uh, building, which um, is certainly somewhat unusual. Um, but DJ, I don't know what you would cite as our most unusual material. I wouldn't, uh, I'll follow your lead on the, the, maybe the, the material that maybe the, is the most self-sabotaging. Um, <laughs> for the Sai Guo Zheng, we had to have the fire alarms turned off in the fire department here. And um, it was it was a scene, but we also, I mean, Nami Yamamoto is on the call. Um, Nami was is our head of our studio and she, I would say um, there was an artist where we grew moths. Um, so we had a space where we were growing moths. So for the fabric workshop to deal with with moths, I think that will follow in a different kind of self-sabotage. But um, that was maybe, I would say, the most, um, one of the, a very threatening, very threatening insect we were growing um, at first in Nami's basement and then bringing them to the, bring them to the, to the workshop. Um, so yeah, that's, those were, that would come, that would be the, um, come to my mind first. Thank you. I want to see documentaries of that, <laughs> all of it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, GE. Um, our next question is going to be from Rachel. And Rachel, if you'd like to unmute, you can. Yeah, as somebody from Philly 
who's extremely interested in fabric workshop, uh, but is a particular kind of artist, a collage artist with fabric sometimes. Um, I'm also interested in junk. And the source of my question is simply, is there a relationship between WAIR, which is the going to the dump basically and getting stuff, which is already a fabulous idea, and fabric workshop and museum in terms of making an application to RAIR, but somehow having no application to fabric workshop. And I was just curious how that, those th things are balanced in the view of Fabric Workshop, to which I might add another very Philly-based question. I'm familiar with the Pew Fellowship, which originally began with no application process and in a very obviously high class and highly informed advisory committee. So people, it was like a fraternity or sorority. At a certain point, that is to get a fellowship involved that, at a certain point, Pew switched. That is, it was no longer felt viable or interesting or appropriate to have only the committee. Um, is there a thought in Fabric Workshop that, this is very leading as a question, that you might switch to an application process at some point or have a mixed process? That's you know, Rachel, that that question is is a really good one and one to which I don't think there's a, a perfect answer. Um, it's certainly something that in in my career in contemporary art I've wrestled with a lot. Um, on the one hand, you want to be open to everybody and and not miss anything, um, which obviously is impossible. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to lead people on through an application process um, and create um, false expectations and, and unnecessary work on you know, the end of the applyee and, and the, the folks doing the review. So we've mentioned our artist advisory committee, and they're important in the process as eyes and ears for us. Um, we also depend very much on our staff and particularly DJ to be out and about and looking and meeting and um, trying to be aware of what's going on. And also, I think perhaps most significantly is the network of artists that we've worked with, um, which is a, a huge resource for us in terms of uh, becoming aware of, of different projects and, and, and other artists that are out there. So that's how we have worked and how we will likely continue to work. But I hear you, it's not perfect. Um, you know, you, you, nor on the other hand is having a straight up application process perfect. Um, so working with Rare as an, you know, you brought that um, up as an example. Um, in some cases we go to Rare and say, hey, we have an artist that, you know, is, is working on a project and, and can we bring them around to see if this would be appropriate for them to source materials. And in other cases, they have artists that they've accepted into their program and they would reach out to, to us or, you know, when I was at Philadelphia Contemporary at Philadelphia Contemporary and say, hey, we've got, a, we've got an artist who is doing something. Is this, does this fit into your curatorial program? So that does kind of go back um, to the from my perspective, at least, the unique nature of Philadelphia. I mentioned the project we're doing with ECO and that that started as a potentially very small scale collaboration between the Asian Arts Initiative and, and the Fabric Workshop and has blossomed into something much more than that. And, and Philly is a place where that kind of thing can happen and does happen and can happen pretty organically and pretty quickly. Amazing. Thank you, Rachel, for that question. Um, and thanks, Harry, so much, DJ. Um, we've got one final question here before we move into a poetry reading. And our final question today will be from Chloe. Yes, thank you so much, Harry. Thank you, DJ. And thank you, Deborah, for this amazingly generous conversation about Fabric Workshop and Museum. 
I first want to say hello to you all from our publisher and artistic director, Fong, who couldn't be here today, but is so excited that you're having this conversation and can't wait to watch it when it's in the archive. And he wanted you to know that he worked one summer in 1982 at Fabric Workshop when it was on Arch Street. Um, and he wishes you all his congratulations. My question is very much related to what Harry you just touched upon, which is when you have artists working over great lengths of time and experimenting in the space, how do you think of Philadelphia itself as an atmosphere for experimentation and collaboration with other institutions and spaces? EJ, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, Philly, it's such an incredible place. Um, the artists here are amazing. Um, there's, it's, it's so possible to collaborate in a way that is meaningful at a scale that is incredible. Um, I, you know, there's a, like all of, all of our curatorial colleagues actually get together and see each other. Um, you know, first opening here, people were, you know, colleagues were coming. Um, so it's a really amazing and supportive community. Um, and it's a community that is, you know, you can go from one side to the other um, and you feel like you're moving through five different neighborhoods, um, and but you see a bunch of things, you know, in one night. Um, so it's a, the community here, I, I mean, there is a Philly ethos to the Fabric Workshop, you know, and it, it's, a, it's where this institution grew up um, and in, it's just inseparable from um, the kind of, you know, there can be some scrappiness. There's a lot of polish, you know, there, there's a lot of fun. There's some ser there's a lot of seriousness too. Um, so that's something that is definitely, you know, I don't know, it, but I really love um, being in Philadelphia, no question. Harry, you have a something, something to add. I'm sure you have a lot to say on that, that topic too. Well, yeah, I mean, before I was at the workshop, I ran Philadelphia Contemporary for many years, and, and it was conceived of as a partnership-based organization. And I, I can't tell you how many uh, different organizations we worked with and, and how, without fail, um, both arts organizations and non-art organizations are completely open to the idea of, of working together and, and making something happen. And, you know, I think Philly is is a in many ways a small town disguised as a big city, and that leads to that sense of of community. And we're big enough that you know we have a robust cultural um, infrastructure, but small enough that we all know um, you know if the Barnes has a great project and and a lot of people are coming to see it, that benefits everybody else because while they're here visiting the barns, they're going to come by the fabric workshop and they're going to go to PAFA and they're going to go to the PMA. And so we all, in that sense, um, celebrate each other's achievements because it, it reflects well on, on the other organizations. And I've never known a city uh, to have that ethos quite as strongly as Philadelphia does. Thank you so much for those answers um, and for this conversation today. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. This has been such an absolute joy. So inspiring. Can't wait to come down to Philly and see everything in person. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of concluding our events with a poetry reading. And today I'm very excited to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Thomas Devaney to the stage. Thomas is the author of six books, including Getting to Philadelphia from Hanging Loose Press. He wrote and directed the film Bicentennial City as well, and um, Thomas is a Pew Fellow in the Arts and published in Best American Poetry and in the Brooklyn Rail. Thomas teaches creative writing at Haverford College and works at the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation at Drexel University. I'm so thrilled to hear you read, Thomas. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Eleanor. <clears throat> Thanks, Deborah and DJ and Harry, too, for this amazing conversation and also all the Braille staff and Fong, the beloved Fong. Um, great to see the slides. Uh, I especially appreciate the one of the Fabric Workshop store, uh, which I uh, I love Virgil Marty's design uh, of that store. And it's subtle, all these um, textures and color, and uh, it's such a pleasure. 
and Tracy at the store. Tracy is a Philadelphia treasure, a tremendous asset to Philadelphia and to the Fabric Workshop. I'm going to read four short poems, all with some tie in to the workshop or to the rail. And um, I think I see my reading as a sort of a community portrait, sort of embodying some of the things that just been said at the, at the very end of this, at least. It's definitely a down to earth community and uh, not, not without its troubles, um, but uh, certainly a, an amazing place. And I wanna dedicate my reading to one of these great Philadelphians who died about a year ago named Blake Bradford. Um, and not just because uh, Blake was a beloved uh, Philadelphian arts advocate, um, beloved member of the community, but I met Blake in 2006 or seven I wrote a book called Letters to Ernesto Neto, and the workshop was had an amazing, cool, labyrinth kind of ex uh, exhibition of Ernesto Neto's work. And I just written this book about Ernesto. Ernesto wrote the afterword for the book, and Blake invited me. I didn't know Blake. He had gotten a copy of the book somehow, because that's the kind of person Blake was, invited me, gave me a generous introduction, and we became lifelong friends after that. So I want to honor Blake. Uh, with this reading. And um, for my first poem, I, I also, thinking of this generous soul named Blake, I thought of another generous soul that has ties to the rail. Um, my first poem uh, is written for the poet and writer, uh, Bill Berkson. And I very much associate Bill and his wife, Connie, with the rail. Uh, so this first poem was called Most of Tomorrow. And I mentioned some of Bill's books in the poem. Yeah. Thanks for putting that picture up of Blake. Most of tomorrow, a lyric for Bill. No socks, no Bill, and no old number two pencil. For the past two weeks on every list, I had his name. I'll be around tomorrow, Bill says. And the rest of the time, where? Number two adds a word or two, annual blood test, sibling, made close and breathing throughout. Wish I could eavesdrop, a line disappearing from his mouth, a title, a tune. These are the titles, Saturday night, moon people, goods and services, repeat after me, expect delays, portrait and dream. Dear Bill, I hold a picture of your note in my hand. It was bruised all over. There's no concealing a hand. I don't know about that, I can hear him say. Oh yes, you can, oh boy, I do, in rich middle tones. A profile in exile, view over the bay at Cassis, his friend, the journalist from Burgundy, and the cold white wine still gives a chill. Found it back in Jersey for $120 and considered it. Now, most of tomorrow has been gone for days, yet the part that was still, yet, the part that was away from the start is still here, firsthand and near. Back around nine, 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 nine will be fine. The next poem I'm going to read is called A Week in the Childhood of W.C. Fields. And I did a book with the Philadelphia photographer, Will Brown. And Will and Emily Brown were longtime uh, supporters and fans of the workshop and friends with Kippy and um, others. And uh, we did a reading for this uh, book with Will at the workshop. And I was very proud that they had copies of it at the store. And a shout out to the Philadelphia Print Center who published the book, A Week in the Childhood of W.C. Fields. Uh, the poem is a Philly story, uh, maybe Philadelphia without end. W.C. Fields played in the cinder fields of Tioga. Back then, no one ever said Philadelphia or Darby, and buffeting was a trade. Large tongs and ice wagons. As a child, Fields had a sooty face and was always out playing or in the game, as he'd say. One was juggling, and another they liked to call, never give a sucker an even break. Monday was a milk cart. Tuesday, an open body dump truck. 
and a gang of cursing boots. Wednesday was a boxcar that everyone said carried raw sugar, and everyone had the sugar to prove it. Thursday was a vivid visit from two dicks in sweaty suits. Friday afternoon, cigarettes and a mess of money out on the street. Saturday day was haircuts for the men, John the Barber and the day numbers. The whole day was a half day and a bucket of bleach. And Saturday night was a whole other day. Thieves and mothers sharpening their knives, girls with curls and bald men, and always the singing and the fighting. The police could do nothing. Sunday was another country, a bath, a window, the ring of the red trim wash basin, and looking at a picture of the old Dutch settlement. The drawing was too small to be this neighborhood, but in a sober moment, his father told him it was, back before any of them were born. I don't know if the people invited me know this, but the fabric workshop is, is part of the fabric of my life. So many of my close friends have worked there throughout the years. Um, Kelly Cobb and Aaron Eigler, uh, two of my best friends, they, they're married now. They met while they were at the fabric workshop. They used to work there. I made a movie with Ma Aaron and um, Matt Sueb. And Kelly is like a lifelong collaborator and like a sister to me. And this next poem I'm going to read is for my actual sister. It's called The World Shows Up. And it pays tribute to my sister, Colleen, who was born with severe intellectual disabilities and um, is nonverbal, but remains highly communicative. It's a very short lyric. And it's a kind of a poem that I almost spent years trying to write, uh, kind of trying to honor and express a profound aspect of my relationship that had just eluded me for years. The short lyric. The world turns up. When my sister and I sit, the day ducks out and the backyard becomes a meadow. When my sister and I sit, Every sound blankets our legs, and we're the only two people in the, suburb in the suburban headlands. Birds fly near, and fire cats flank the periphery. We drink our coffee black and never talk. When my sister and I sit, there's no me and no she. We are a round place, breathing. And I have one more poem. As DJ was mentioning the scrappy Philly ethos, perhaps this is an homage to that. <laughs> it's called Oregon Avenue. Maybe my one comment on this poem is that uh, Philadelphia has sharpened all of my senses, especially my ear. Oregon Avenue. You can't find a place to smoke anymore, Rose says, smoking and rifling through her handbag, looking for a number. She sits in the back seat with Meg. They're not singing. The ball game's on inside, and outside, the game is always on. Actually, sometimes they do sing. What year is the car? A 98? A Ford? A Focus? They always tip, too. There is dust, always, and terrible dirt. But if that's what you see, you're hardly looking. We believe in the front stoop. We believe in the back of the Ford. We believe that, we believe that in the heat of day, shadows come back. The trash can on fire says things are hotting up. The streets a mix, water, water ice, live crabs, jumbo jets, firecrackers. Summer days are huge and often overlap late into the fall. Seriously, when you have a good spot, why move the car? So happy to be with everyone this afternoon. Thank you so, so, so much, Thomas. That was 
stunning. I cannot think of a better expansion slash conclusion of the conversation today. Um, and again, a huge thanks to Harry and DJ and Deborah for the wonderful dialogue and to the team at Fabric Workshop for all the amazing work that y'all do. Um, such an honor. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring this NSC program, and they help make these daily conversations possible, as well as support our growing archive, which lives on the Rails YouTube channel and where this conversation will be up shortly. For the past 22 years, the Rail has been a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the work we do here at the Rail. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Hearn Party and Amanda Millet Sorsa on the occasion of just looking at Bowery Gallery. We will conclude with a reading by Simon Pettit. Um, thank you all for tuning in today. It's been wonderful to share a space with you. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the question. Thank you. So much. Good day, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. So much. <laughs> Thanks for the info thank and for Tom. Thank you, Harry thank you. and DJ. Thank you, thank Deborah. You. Thank you, Thomas. This was so lovely. Thank Thanks to the rail. Thank you. Thomas, that reading was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.